This scene is not taking place in the Congo. It has nothing to do with Johannesburg or Cape Town. It is not Nyasaland or Nigeria. This is Florida. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. This is a shape up for migrant workers. The hawkers are chanting the going peace rate at the various fields. This is the way the humans who harvest the food for the best fed people in the world get hired. One farmer looked at this and said, we used to own our slaves, now we just rent them. The Secretary of Labor looked at the migrant plight and said, I think they're the great mass of what I've called uh, the excluded Americans. They are people who cry out, the workers and their children and their wives, who cry out for some assistance and uh, whose uh, plight is a shame. It's a shame in America. The president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest farmers organization, says, I think that uh, most uh, social workers would agree that it's better for a man to be employed even if his capacity is such as uh, to limit his uh, income. And uh, we take the position that it's far better to have thousands of these folks who are practically unemployable earning some money, doing some productive work for at least a few days in the year. This is an American story that begins in Florida and ends in New Jersey and New York State with the harvest. It is a 1960 Grapes of Wrath that begins at the Mexican border in California and ends in Oregon and Washington. It is the story of men and women and children who work 136 days of the year and average $900 a year. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. Well, I don't know. It don't look like we'll ever get ahead. I guess we'll just have to keep going till we can find something better. A minister named Cassidy, who works with them, says, They are just as bad as the slaves. Only on name they are not slaves, but in the way they are treated, they are worse than slaves. And somebody has to make a thousands of dollars out of his sweat. Is that a slave or not? They are the migrants, workers in the sweatshops of the soil the harvest of shame. Now, Edward R. Murrow. This is CBS Reports, Harvest of Shame. It has to do with the men, women, and children who harvest the crops in this country of ours, the best-fed nation on earth. These are the forgotten people, the underprotected, the undereducated, the underclothed, the underfed. We present this report of Thanksgiving because were it not for the labor of the people you are going to meet, you might not starve, but your table would not be laden with the luxuries that we have all come to regard as essentials. We should like you to meet some of your fellow citizens who harvest the food for the best-fed nation on Earth. David Lowe talks to Mrs. Doby, 34 years old, mother of nine children. Mrs. Doby, what, uh, what, what things do you pick up north? We pick strawberries and cherries. Who works with you out of this family here? Everybody except the baby. Who takes care of them in the field? Well, they just kindly stay along with us or take care of theirself. The one that can't walk usually stays in the baby buggy. What is an average dinner for the family? Well, we just 
You mean, what do we have in... Yes. We... Well, I cook a pot of beans and fry some potatoes or some corn or something like that. How many quarts of milk do you buy for the children? Well, we don't, I don't, we don't have milk except maybe when we draw our paycheck, we have milk about once a week. For all these children, you have the milk? The baby has, uh, she is on the bottle and she uses about 15 cans of milk a week. But the older children have milk about once a week. Do they like to drink milk, Mrs. Dobbs? Yes, they like milk. The only reason I asked that question, I was quite shocked that they had milk only once a week. I just thought they didn't like it. But they, they like milk, but it's, well, there's so many, it, a gallon of milk will make them a glass around, and so we just can't afford it every day. What do you want most for your children, Mrs. Dobie? Well, I'd like for them to have a career, whatever they'd want to be. When they got older, of course, the smaller ones, they've not don't realize yet to know what they'd like to be. But the older, the older girl, she'd like to go to school if she could, because she she'll probably be like the boy, have to quit as soon as she's old enough. She's, she really likes to go to school, but she had to miss last week because she had to keep the baby for me to work. Mrs. Doby, wouldn't you ever care to have a house of your own? I'd like to have a house if we plan to buy one if we could ever get enough to pay down on one, we'd buy one. Do you think this will ever happen? Well, it don't seem like it. This is Belle Glade, Florida, where the exodus has its beginning every year. The migrants call it their home, what the circus people call their winter quarters, their Sarasota. Charles Goodlett, chief of police of Belglade, says, The problem that we have now are the ones that, that come here that uh, don't have the money to rent a room uh, they, they'll sleep around the bars, in the grass, in the packing houses, uh, around the lake area, uh, in the parks, any place they can find to, uh, to sleep, to rest for a few hours. They come here with one thought in mind, is to survive till the end of this season and save enough money to get to, to the next state, going north. From towns like this throughout Florida and throughout the South, the two to three millions move out on their annual migration, which ends in late November. They carry with them whatever little they possess, whatever little they are. At the Okeechobee labor camp, while families were preparing to move north, there was still some work in the bean fields. Children, as usual, were left to fend for themselves. Jerome, uh, how old are you? Nine. Nine? Do you go to school? Yes. Yeah. Where do you go to school, Jerome? I did the old children elementary school. I see. What is your sister's name? Lois. That's Lois. And uh, what are your other sister's names? Catherine and Beulah. Catherine and Beulah. What happened to your foot, Jerome? Dig a nail in out there by the wash house. So you drove a nail in out by the wash house. What did your mother do for that? She put some alcohol on it. Where do you sleep, Jerome? In this bed. You have this big bed? Yeah. What happened? How did you get that hole in that bed there, Jerome? The rat. The what? Rat. Now, Jerome, you are taking care of Kathy, of Beulah, and Lois. Yes. Yeah. Now, are you going to give them lunch today? Yes. Yeah. What are you going to feed them? I don't know. Uh, do you have any food here to give them? Yes. Yeah. I see. What time does your mother come home? I don't know. The following day, Aline King, the mother of Jerome, Kathy, Lois, and Beulah, again was picking beans. Aileen King, I saw your children yesterday at the Okeechobee camp. 
Why didn't you put them in the nursery? I don't make enough to pay for it. How much does it cost to put them in? 85 cents. 85 cents. That's right. Elaine, what time did you come out the field this morning? Six o'clock. What time would you get home? About 3.30 to 4 o'clock. Six this morning to 4 o'clock this afternoon. That's right. How much did you earn? A dollar. One dollar? That's right. One dollar. Is that because the beans were of poor quality? That's right. Has this happened before? That's right. Uh, how much will your food cost you today? About two dollars. Aileen, how old are you? Twenty-nine. How many children do you have? Fourteen. How old were you when you first started working in the fields? Eight. You've been working 21 years in the fields? That's right. Aileen, do you ever think you'll be able to get out of this kind of work? No, sir. All the migrants travel fourth class. If there is a privileged class, they ride in their own jalopy, in the best Joad family tradition. The long journey begins. Through Atlanta, Nashville, Indianapolis, en route to the fields and orchards of America. Lowell has been following the migrants for the past nine months. Some are freewheelers who travel as a family unit. He met the Parsons family as they were about to leave Belle Glade tomatoes for Indiana strawberries. Mr. Parsons, do you think the farmers you work for care about your problems? No, sir. They're not in particular worried about you. They just want their stuff out and you get away as quick as possible. Would you say that you're welcomed when you're needed? Well, that is the only time that you are welcome is when they are needing you. They're, they're friendly and everything, but once they're done with you, why well, they'd rather for you to move. Did they ever ask you to leave their places? Oh, yeah. They tell you if you finish up like tomorrow, why well, they had rather for you to be out and gone in about three days, and that way it'll cut down on their electric bills and all of the other stuff. What do you want most in this world for you and your family? I'd like for my family to be well, stay together as much as possible, I'd like to be on a farm somewhere out away from so many people to where they could attend one church and be interested mostly in one school. And that way I believe they'd all be better satisfied. Mr. Parsons, do you think this will ever happen? Not to rate it I'm going now, no. Most of them ride 1,500 to 2,000 miles to work in vehicles owned by crew leaders who recruit the workers for the migration north. This is the Roach family looking for work. Mr. Roach, how did you happen to come to this place? Well, I came to Augusta, and I was talking to some people, and they told me to come on down to Waycross, that it was a smart work around Waycross, see? Well, how, how many miles have you been traveling looking for work so far? About 1,600 and something. Mr. Roach, where did you spend the night last night with your family? Over in the woods. Pulled up on the side of the road, a uh, little dirt road, and slept side, in the woods, outside the car. May I ask you, sir, what did you have for dinner and your family last night? Well, we had uh, blown sausages and uh, loaf bread. That isn't very good food for a growing family, is it? Well, we made it on it. How much money do you have in the world right at this moment? I only have about a dollar and uh, 45 cents. Well, what do you intend to do about food for your family today? Well, I've, I've always worked and I always figured I could, I could get work. I had never um, been where I couldn't get a little something to do. The vegetables the migrants picked yesterday move north swiftly on rails. Produce en route to the tables of America by a trailer is refrigerated and carefully packed to prevent bruising. Cattle carried to market by federal regulation must be watered, fed, and rested for five hours every 28 hours. People, men, women, and children, are carried to the fields of the North in journeys as long as four days and three nights. They often ride 10 hours 
without stop for food or facilities. The first stop is normally at Yulee, Florida, one mile from the Georgia border, a checkpoint for farm labor leaving the state. Okay. Okay. There are other stops, Kingsland, Georgia, for bread and sandwich meat. Darien, Georgia, for facility. A roadside stop en route in South Carolina. One thousand miles north of Belle Glade, Florida, by way of U.S. Route 17 and 301. Through Jacksonville, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, and New Bern is Elizabeth City, North Carolina. A bean stop, good for six weeks' work. This camp was home for 40 days for the families of Tom Lockett's crew, now 30 hours out of Belle Glade. Mr. Blakely, how many years have you been working in agriculture, in the fields? Oh, practically all of my life. It, I haven't did no other work much but in the field all of my life. I raised all my kids working in the field. I noticed that uh, there's some straw over there. Uh, what is that for? Well, that was the straw they brought for the people to sleep on. Well, uh, weren't mattresses supplied here? They used to be, but they ain't now. Mrs. Blakely, where is the water supply over here? That's it right, John. For how many people? For this and that over yonder, they all use the same. And how many how many bathrooms are there here? Now. Where do you where do you use the bathroom? Where is where are the facilities? Don't have one. We use our tin tubes. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Brown, how did the children uh, fare on the journey up north? Well, they got kind of. Fretful, you know, and you know, got so riding, handling them. But we made it. Miss Brown, may I ask how old you are? I'm 37. Mrs. Brown, how many years have you been working in the fields? All my life. Do you remember how old you were when you started? I was about eight years old. Would you like to get out of this work? I sure would. Do you think you'll ever be able to? I'm hoping so. Do you think you'll be able to, though? I don't know. 20 miles from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the workers, driven 900 miles north by crew leader Norman Hall, pick beans at the prevailing rate of 50 cents a hamper. Lunch is not a picnic, whether brought from the labor camp or purchased at the open air kitchen. Or in a bottle, heated by the rays of the sun. In a survey in 21 states conducted by the National Council of Churches, the migrants themselves listed the evils of labor camp life. Bad housing, flies, mosquitoes, dirty beds and mattresses, unsanitary toilets, and lack of hot water for bathing. One employer of hundreds of migrant laborers was asked, are they happy people? Well, I guess they got a little gypsy in their blood. They just like it. A lot of them wouldn't do anything else. A lot of them don't know any different. That's all they want to do. They love it. They love to go from place to place. They don't have a worry in the world. They're happier than we are. Today, they eat. Tomorrow, they don't worry about. They're the happiest race of people on earth. Mr. Jones, do you think that uh, the migratory laborer makes a living wage? They make a poor living. In other words, uh, sometimes it's just like the farmer. Sometimes when things are good, when the yields are good and they can make good money, they make a good living. It, but uh, take year in and year out from different seasons, different sections of the country, I'd say no. They make a poor living.
There are days when beans are not ready for harvest, and that's one more day with no income. Ed King, a crew leader, hauled his workers to this camp at Powell's Landing, Virginia, where they worked five weeks pulling corn and picking beans. And when the fields have been stripped in North Carolina and Virginia, the trucks and buses again move north. This is Little Creek Ferry outside of Norfolk. 20,000 migrants are ferried to the fertile fields of the Virginia Cape and the eastern shores of Maryland and Delaware for beans, tomatoes, asparagus, and potatoes. For one crew, hardship was climaxed by disaster, the death of a migrant. We had a little trouble on the road about four o'clock this morning, Sunday morning, and uh, a car and a little red. One of the key. Has this uh, ever happened before uh, with any crews coming up north? Uh, once as I remember, I was in the field of North Carolina. What happened? Uh, everybody got killed. Every year, as predictable as the seasons, there are accidents resulting in death and serious injury to these laborers. On June 6, 1957, at the intersection of U.S. Route 301 and State Highway 102, nine miles from Fayetteville, North Carolina. 21 migrants were killed, 17 males, three females, and the baby boy. The police report stated one of the causes of the high loss of life was the packaging of the occupants of the truck. Today, only six states have laws providing for the safe transportation of migrants within their borders. The state of North Carolina is not one of the six. Secretary of Labor Mitchell. Hardly a year goes by that we don't read in the paper of some very serious accident where uh, uh, sometimes a dozen or more people have been killed purely because there is no interstate standard with regard to safety. Another complication of the migrant stream is the constant flow of foreign workers into the available pool of domestic workers. Hundreds of thousands of Mexican braceros and thousands of offshore laborers from the Caribbean area, hired by contract, depress the wage scale of the domestic migrant. This controversy is most bitter on the West Coast. Joseph Woods, a Marine combat veteran of the Pacific, competes against the braceros. Lowe talked to the Woods family under a tree which was their home in California. Mr. Woods, how did you happen to pick this spot to camp? Well, someone told us about it, <laughs> and they said it was all right to camp here. Where do you get your water supply? We go to town after it. And how do you bring it back here? In the can. We have a 10-gallon can. What do you use for sanitary facilities, Mr. Woods? Well, just get by the best we can. How many days will you have to be picking cherries in order to find enough money to move into a house, Mr. Well, Wood. probably quite a few. It, they usually want a month's rent in advance, so by the time the cherries are over here, we'll be moving somewhere else anyway. Mrs. Wood, tell me about the children. Do they go out uh, in the orchards and work with you when you work? Well, we have taken them out uh, sometimes, but they're a little too small to work. Who we, takes care of them here? My father stays here and takes care of them usually. Do you think that you'll ever make enough money picking fruit, Mr. Woods, in order to get settled down in one place and have a home of your own? I don't think so. Throughout the United States, there are others, like the Woods family, who are not able to enjoy the luxury of living in a labor camp. In New Jersey, a few miles from Princeton, is this labor camp. There are two water taps and two outhouses. Families live in one room, usually in one bed. The single men live in the bull pit. Their space, one bunk. Four people live in this room in New Jersey. A family of six will move into this room. Nearby, a trotting raceway has new stables for horses. They cost $500,000.
At Kutchog, New York, 300 migrants live in this camp owned and operated by the Potato Growers Association of Long Island. This is migrant housing, 90 miles from Times Square. <laughs> Some have tried to leave the endless migratory stream. Wherever this happens, the local slum areas expand. This is Riverhead, Long Island, New York. A minister said, this is as primitive as man can live. This settlement of former migrants is called the Bottoms. In Shenango County, New York State, a farm labor camp, the ultimate goal of Ed King's crew, 1,257 miles from Belle Glade. The migrant mission serves one half pint of milk and one cracker to each child. This is their lunch. Their parents eat lunch in the field, sometimes 75 miles away. This is the living space of Eileen King and her five children. The room is similar to their winter quarters in Belglade, only smaller. Charles Schumann, president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, says, We're the only group of people that furnish housing for our workers. And we furnish these uh, extra benefits, perquisites. Uh, some people, some sections call it the furnish. And uh, it's almost impossible to calculate the value of these added uh, benefits at the same time, we don't condone inadequate housing. Mr. Schumann, why does the American Farm Bureau Federation so violently oppose federal legislation? I think there'll be more rapid progress with state regulation than there will be with federal regulation. We think that uh, federal legislation will follow the route that almost all federal legislation does of uh, additional and more stringent and more uh, regulations with more and more red tape and uh, more cutting to a certain pattern all over the country. In effect, uh, it would uh, probably uh, rule out the use of migrant labor very quickly. The middleman between the farmer and the migrant is the crew leader, a remnant of the padrone system in wide use 60 years ago. Ed King, a crew leader, says, Well, a crew leader, he have to, in a way, he have to be the father and mother and all when he takes this crew out because the whole crew mostly be dependent direct on him. Reverend Michael Cassidy, who travels with the migrants, says... Well, um, some of the crew leaders, they are good, but the majority of them, they are bad. They are so bad that they are the worst that they can be. They're trying to skin alive these migrants. They take every diamond, the dime they make, they try every scheme as possible. For instance, they, they pay the, the owner, the grower, pay them 45 cents to pick a crate of tomatoes. And then they turn around, they pay the labor 12 cents at the most. And uh, natural, uh, they have three or 40 or 50 or 100 people picking tomatoes. He makes, I know a man last year he made in here, right in here, four $15,000, the crew leader. And all the men they left in here, and, and I met him in Alabama, they were broke. They didn't have a dime because they didn't make the money themselves. Everyone who knows anything about this situation agrees that the best hope for the future of the migrants lies in the education of their children. But for the children of migrants, education is not easy to come by. There are 600,000 of them. Most state child labor laws ignore farm children. 
And so far as the children of migrants are concerned, almost without exception, they leave school at the age of 16 forever. The United States Office of Education reports that the migratory workers have the highest rate of illiteracy in the country. Approximately one out of every 500 children whose parents are still migrant laborers finishes grade school. Approximately one out of every 5,000 ever finishes high school. And there is no case upon the record of the child of a migrant laborer ever receiving a college diploma. Only six states have summer schools for migrants. The New Jersey School Center is at Cranberry. Laura, how old are you? Eleven. Eleven, what grade are you in? In the sixth. Sixth grade. Uh, do you intend to go to high school, Laura? Yes. What would you like to be? I'd like to be a teacher. What would you like to teach? Uh, about, I'd like to teach the fifth grade. What do you think about going to school here in Cranberry, New Jersey, Harriet? I like it. I like it. Well, good. Would you, uh, do you have any idea what you want to do when you grow up? Be a teacher. Well, good. How old are you, Patricia? Eight. What nine. grade? Nine. What grade are you in? Four. Do you uh, have any idea what you want to be uh, when you grow up? Yes. What's that? A nurse. Otis, what would you like to do when you grow up? Be a doctor. You're going to be a doctor? Yes. What kind of a doctor do you know? I'd rather be a dentist. A dentist? Mrs. Christine Schack, their teacher, was asked about her pupils. Mrs. Schack, uh, do uh, your pupils, who are most of them children of migrant families, uh, are they anxious to get an education? Terribly anxious, even more so than the child in the normal school year. Do they get any help from their parents as far as schoolwork is concerned? Usually, you will find that the parents themselves are not educated. When we go out to enroll the children, oftentimes the parent will make an X and the person interviewing will have to sign it in order to get permission for the child to be enrolled in school. Mrs. Shack, how does this problem affect you personally? I think maybe I feel a bit of responsibility toward these children because I realize that we here in New Jersey reap the benefits of their parents' labor and the children are suffering because their parents are here doing this. I saw one bright little girl. Her name was Laura Weeks. Will she really have a chance to continue her education? Laura is from a rural area in Florida, and she is from an exceedingly large family. In fact, I believe there are eight or nine girls, all girls in the family. They have been coming to New Jersey now for about three or four years, to my knowledge. Laura is one of my returning pupils. I've seen great progress from year to year in Laura. We've had her for three sessions. However, I think because of the family's financial conditions and the size of the family and the fact that she is in a rural area that she probably will get no farther than upper junior high school or maybe complete high school with luck. What about Harriet Damon? Harriet, too, is from a very large family. There are nine children in the Damon family. We have six of them here in the summer program. She is the oldest of the nine. I doubt seriously that Harriet will have an opportunity to, to advance her education. One can't help but have compassion for those who find themselves in such a condition. The federal government spends six and a half million dollars annually protecting migratory wildlife. This year, Congress failed to appropriate three and a half million dollars to educate migratory children. Senator Harrison Williams, chairman of the Subcommittee on Migratory Labor, was asked if state or federal legislation was the answer. Many aspects can only be successfully uh, dealt with at a national level. For example, wages. Uh, we, we can't, uh, we, we see states in competitive positions. They're re reluctant to raise wages uh, through legislation in their state because their farmers are uh, competing with uh, farmers in other states. And we see in education uh, some states who have taken great strides we can't expect states to do it alone uh, when they know their neighboring state with whom their farmers compete are not doing anything. Uh, we we uh, know that uh, just about everybody in this country has some federal support for adequate housing through FHA or whatever the program is, except uh, the farm community. And the migrant farmer is the most poorly housed member of our society. Senator Williams, a Democrat, and Secretary of Labor Mitchell, a Republican, 
have called for legislation which will probably come before the next session of Congress. And only last week, President Eisenhower made the Presidential Committee on Migrants a permanent body. But the real problem is that there are many kinds of farmers and many kinds of crops. The big mechanized grain and dairy farmers use little or no migrant labor. Some of the major canneries do pay fair wages and provide adequate housing. However, it must be stated that most of the fruit and vegetable farmers find it economically impossible to build good housing like this to be used only six weeks a year. The farmer claims he is trapped between what society expects and his market demands. Howard Jones, a grower in Florida, was asked if he knew what his beans picked that day would bring in the market. Well, uh, you can't tell from one day to another. Some days you'll go down there and you'll get $5, and I've seen them drop to a dollar and a half the next day. Or one day they'll be $3, and the next day they might be 2 or one day they'll be 2 and the next day they could be 4 Who sets your price? Well, uh, that's what we're all trying to figure out. Uh, everybody, I don't know the answer, but uh, the chains have seemed to have more to do with setting the prices than anyone else. There's too much difference between the price that they pay and the farmers all over the country. And uh, something, we've thought about trying to get somebody to investigate it, some of the congressmen, the senators, but you go up there to Washington, we had a group of boys go up there here a couple of years ago. They gave them a run around. Agriculture Department, they all give them a run around. I, I, we believe that those chains have lobbyists in Washington, and uh, they're going to do pretty well as what they please. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, some of the growers have told us that the chain stores fix the prices and they cannot meet those prices if they pay their labor a higher wage. What about that? Well, I wonder if that's a very valid argument. That might be said of uh, many other industries. Uh, it, uh, it might be said, for example, of the garment industry, and I've heard it alleged that uh, uh, retailers uh, dictate to the manufacturer the price they will pay for a garment and uh, in effect say, you produce the garment at that price no matter what it takes to produce it. Uh, however, the garment worker in this country fares very well uh, in terms of standard of living, uh, due in large measure uh, to the efforts of people like Mr. Potofsky and Mr. Dubinsky of the ILGWU and the uh, amalgamated clothing workers and others who have uh, taken what uh, was a very substandard in industry uh, the, in, is not so long ago, 1911, the great fire in New York. Uh, today, these workers are, are thriving members of the community. And, and the price that uh, my wife pays for a garment today, she gets a much better garment uh, than, uh, uh, than her mother ever had, at a lower price. So this argument that the, uh, uh, that the farmer has to meet the uh, uh, dictation of the chain store leaves me rather cold. The migrant farm worker occupies the lowest level of any major group in the American economy. The soil has produced no Samuel Gompers or John L. Lewis. As Secretary of Labor Mitchell states, I think the AFL-CIO in the past has been too preoccupied with uh, uh, other affairs and probably uh, uh, the farm problem was so tough that uh, they were reluctant to tackle it. Uh, I think uh, their attitude and policy has changed uh, and uh, they're making a greater effort now to organize than they ever have in the past. Farm labor, however, is excluded from all federal legislation designed to protect the rights of those engaged in interstate commerce to organize and bargain collectively. In 1959, the AFL-CIO set aside $100,000 in an effort to organize the fruit pickers of California. One of the large growers in California was asked what he thought of this effort to organize the fruit pickers. I think their very lack of progress and their very lack of success in signing up members has shown that the industrial type of union which they represent has no place or application to agriculture.
Charles Schumann, president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, was asked how his organization felt about unions. I think that the agricultural worker has needs to have the right to, to change jobs, freedom to move about, freedom to quit if he doesn't like it, freedom to protest, freedom to negotiate, or they are organized, but the right to strike at the time of harvest ought to be regulated uh, in some manner. The AF of LCIO organizing committee in California thinks differently. Earlier this year, they called a strike meeting of cherry pickers in Stockton. Always on the go for a winter stake in summer, and the pay has been too low. A meeting reminiscent of the days of auto and steel organizing in the 30s. We stand as one or fail. Keep your hand upon the dollar and the dime for every pail. Louis Crana, an official of the organizing committee. Your negotiating committee met with cherry industry representatives for the first time in the history of agriculture. They set a minimum of 110 per 16 quart bucket for good and average picking. Now some contractors and growers will try to beat down that minimum price. And they'll say that they can't afford to pay 110 a bucket for the big crop, that they're squeezed, that the Chrysler Imperial needs fixing, or Junior's Thunderbird is on the blink. <laughs> Now it's up to you and the rest of the pickers. It's your program. It represents united action. Sure, you can get a job, but if you can't live on what you make, what good is the job? You make a, about five or ten dollars today, and tomorrow you're just looking for a job and they stay on the street, looking for a job. Now, my, you don't got to no job to, uh, another day. But what do the local people supposed to do? We live anywhere, in a tent, under a shade tree, under a river bridge. We drink water out of a creek or anywhere we can get it. Five or six families drink out of one cup, a tin can, or anything else. We're to blame. We tolerate that stuff. If we stick together and say we won't do it, we won't pick your chairs until you give us some uh, restrooms in the field for the ladies, some for the men, and some water fit to drink, we won't pick them. We get them. The fruits of the earth must be harvested to feed and sustain mankind. What have you to show for picking since the harvest has begun? We have barely made expenses, but we've set a going scale. Keep your hand upon the dollar and the dime for every pail. The question posed by thoughtful men is, must the two to three million migrants who help feed their fellow Americans work, travel, and live under conditions that wrong the dignity of man? Howard Van Smith, awarded a Pulitzer Prize for his series of articles on migrant labor in the Miami News, says this. I knew next to nothing of the migrant situation four to five years ago. I knew there were migrant camps, but a migrant was just a person who worked in a farm to me. After seeing what I have, I am sure that I will devote the rest of my life to doing what little I can to help solve this problem. Secretary of Labor James Mitchell says, I feel sad. I feel sad because I think that it, it's a blot on my conscience as well as the conscience of uh, all of us who are, uh, whom society has treated uh, a little more favorably than these people. They have no voice uh, in the legislative halls, they certainly have no voice in Congress, 
and uh, their employers do have a voice. Their employers are highly organized and uh, make their wants and uh, terms and conditions known to uh, our legislators. I know of no greater pressure lobby, so-called, in Washington than the farm group. In all the, the, the matters in which I am interested in, uh, I have been frustrated uh, to a greater extent than in any other sphere of activity as Secretary of Labor in my inability uh, to make any impact at all uh, on, in terms of either regulations or law that would help uh, the farm workers and the pressures of the farm groups are, are tremendous. We uh, guarantee to the farmer no loss in certain crops. Uh, there the farmer likes to participate in the government largesse, but uh, Lord help the fellow like myself who dares suggest that perhaps the government should do something about the workers that work on farms. It's, it's, it seems to me that, that uh, uh, in our kind of a country, uh, we uh, no longer quarrel with the idea that uh, a man is worthy of his hire, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. Uh, after all, uh, the employers of this country, as indeed the workers, are part of our, uh, of our way of life. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's morally wrong, it seems to me, for any man, any employer, uh, to exploit his workers. In this day and age, I don't think we should tolerate it. As a citizen, uh, in or out of this office, uh, I propose to continue to raise my voice uh, until uh, the country recognizes that it has an obligation to do something for them. And while men of goodwill seek to right injustice, the migrant, the lonely wanderer, the outcast, is trapped in the stream. Now it is November, the last of the laborers, in trucks, buses, and cars, approach the southern states to start the cycle all over again. The Sunshine State welcomes them back. Homestead, Immokalee, Pahokee, Belglade, and hundreds of other communities. This is home. New housing is available. The rent, $15 per room per week. The migrant is at the mercy of the weather. This year in Florida, there was a freeze killing beans, tomatoes, celery, corn. Its byproduct was a bread line. Migratory farm workers are not eligible for unemployment insurance. This happened in the United States in 1960. A line of humans waiting for a ration of tinned goods, milk and bread. The Secretary of Labor says, for the rest of my life, in or out of office, I propose to do something for them. A hardened newspaper man says, for the rest of my life, I will do what little I can to help. But perhaps Julian Griggs, a chaplain for the migrants, speaks for all of us. Is it possible to have love without justice? Is it possible that we uh, think too much in terms of charity, in terms of Thanksgiving Day baskets, in terms of Christmas baskets, and not in terms enough of eliminating poverty? The migrants are back in Belglade, winter quarters, after months of travel and work. 
One said he brought back a dollar and 65 cents. Another said six dollars. Another said we broke even. We were broke when we left, broke when we got back. We asked them what they thought they could do to help themselves, and they said nothing. What can we do? Last week, a presidential committee made up of the secretaries of labor, agriculture, interior, and health, welfare, and education made certain recommendations regarding the migrants. Here are some of them. Extend child labor laws to cover agricultural workers. Eliminate residence requirements so that migrants will be eligible for health, education, and welfare programs. A federal law requiring crew leaders to register, thus protecting migrants from exploitation. Extension of workmen's compensation laws to agriculture. New housing regulations. States to pay local school boards for the education of migrant children. There will, of course, be opposition to these recommendations. Too much government interference, too expensive socialism. Similar proposals have been made before. In fact, 150 different attempts have been made in Congress to do something about the plight of the migrants. All except one has failed. The migrants have no lobby. Only an enlightened, aroused, and perhaps angered public opinion can do anything about the migrants. The people you have seen have the strength to harvest your fruit and vegetables. They do not have the strength to influence legislation. Maybe we do. Good night and good luck.